Welcome to another episode of Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm also joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Chris Dorides, uh, the Deputy Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and Ryan Sweet, the Head of Real-Time uh, Economics. And we'll get to the get to these guys in, in just a minute. Uh, just to give you the frame, um, uh, part one uh, of the conversation is going to be, uh, we're each going to identify a, a statistic, a data point, an event that we think uh, was critical to uh, understanding what's been going on over the past week or uh, will be important for the coming week. Um, although that's rather limiting. I, I, you can pick any statistic you want. That's kind of sort of how I was thinking about it. Part two, uh, the big topic. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about uh, President Biden's proposed uh, infrastructure plan part of his Build Back Better agenda, and we'll dig into that. A lot of controversy around that and debate, and we're going to weigh in, and then I'll give you my uh, three cents at the end, kind of tying it all together. So uh, that's uh, where we're headed. So uh, with that, uh, the, the big statistic, uh, the key statistic, and Ryan, you're head of real-time economics. Uh, so correct. give us a real-time statistic. What, what are you looking at? What do you think we should all be looking at? $71.1 billion. That was the nominal wait, trade wait, deficit. Wait, wait, wait. 71.1 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you Chris, want to guess what, what is Trade deficit. That's the trade deficit. Ah. Mm -hmm. Good one. <laughs> Did Good I get one. it right? Yeah. yeah, the nominal trade deficit. Oh, the nominal February. trade deficit for February. Okay. So yeah, that was up so three. Important? Because this is going to be the new norm. We're going to be running enormous trade deficits over the next several months. And some of that's attributed to the weakness in the global economy, the strength in the US dollar but also the fiscal stimulus. When you throw a lot of money into the economy, we're gonna be importing a lot of uh, goods and services, particularly with the shift of consumer spending away from services to goods. This trade deficit's not gonna narrow anytime soon. Yeah, you're, you're a bit of a downer though, I'd say, Brian. I mean, because uh, <laughs> you know, there's nothing but good news here. And the reason why the trade deficit's growing is because the economy is strong, right? Oh yeah, no, I think it's a good oh. one. Oh yeah, I'm, oh. Not, I'm oh. not saying the trade okay. deficit's bad. Okay. I think this is a good number. Because the import numbers suggest that, you know, the domestic economy is improving. Yeah, got it. So uh, are we running a bigger trade deficit with any country or countries in particular, or is it just across the board? It's fairly you across know? the board, but China yeah. widened, you know, quite noticeably between January and February. Oh, is that right? And mm -hmm. is our trade deficit with China any bigger, smaller than it was before the phase one trade deal that was struck right before the pandemic? Do you remember that? It's, it's, Trump? It's, it's a little smaller. Not, but not a big difference. I don't believe so. I got to double so, check. So but. you would think that phase one trade deal, hard to know given all the moving parts here, but you don't think that was a big deal at the end of the yeah, day? Yeah, I think even without the pandemic, I don't think the, the trade deal would have made a, an enormous dent in the, in the uh, trade deficit with China. Okay, well, let's like, put this I, into context, though, in the context. Okay, so we think the economy is measured by GDP is going to grow somewhere between 6 and 7%, you know, this year. Uh, how, uh, what is the drag on GDP from the growing trade deficit? What would uh, it have been right now, it's a full percentage point. Percentage, percentage point. point. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so if the trade deficit was just neutral with respect to the economy, this year growth would be between 7 or 8 Percent. Correct. And normally, and course, I mean, we're talking big numbers now, six, 7%. But when we're you know, tracking GDP in our high frequency model, when we're down like two or 3%, the trade deficit meant a lot more of a drag. But now, you know, it's, it's kind of like a round, rounding error. Okay, very good. Okay, that's a good statistic. Uh, you know, I think you can do better. Uh, but you know, uh, that's okay. Uh, so you so just keep an eye on it, but it's not yeah. a, yeah. Not a feature, right? well, so, jobless claims, you ignore jobless oh. claims. Well, that I want to ask you about that. You know, the jobless claims numbers, of course, we were all focused on that early in the pandemic because that was a real read on how uh, a big a problem uh, the pandemic was to the labor market and the economy. Uh, but they remain very, they're coming in, they're coming down with the improving economy, but they remain very elevated. Uh, I mean, I think last week, regular initial UI claims were what, over 700K, and then you throw in the pandemic. Uh, unemployment, uh, and that would put it, what, 850K, something like mm -hmm. that. And just for context, a well-functioning economy, which is what we had, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were 225 per week, maybe, uh, you know, 235, something like that. So we're still 
four times what you would kind of expect in a, in a good economy. So what's going on? I mean, is the economy that bad or what, no. what's going on there? No, okay. no, I think you got to throw jobless claims out the window. I think, no. I think there, there's a lot of fraud. There's multiple filers. There's a lot of issues with the data. I mean, think about we're over a year into the, uh, after the pandemic began and jobless claims have been north of 700,000 every week, but one. And, you know, even the last week's jobless claims would have been among the highest during the peak of any recession we've seen in recent memory. So you throw on top of that, you look at, you know, the census poll survey that shows a big pickup in hours worked, number of businesses that are hiring, look at the job numbers that we're getting from the BLS, the jolts data, not, nothing really jibes with jobless claims. And this pains me to say this, but I mean, jobless claims used to be my favorite economic indicator because they didn't send false signals. But now I, I, I don't believe them. You know, Chris, the fact that uh, I'm now I'm talking to Chris about you, Ryan. Uh, you know, Chris, the fact that UI claims were his favorite statistic is makes is certainly a window into how weird Ryan really is. You know, deep down. Yeah, I you know, thought uh, I thought he was a yield curve fan, but uh, that's what I thought. You know, yeah. that's exactly what I thought a yield curve fan. Yeah, there's nothing more that I don't like more than the yield curve. <laughs> really oh, can you explain that what, what what's that why that's, why that's that? a whole nother podcast i mean we could oh, it's a whole nother we're podcast gonna, we're okay. gonna spend hours on that next time the yield curve gets close to inverting all right but put that in the book we're, we're gonna do that as the big topic at some point down the road okay to, chris to, to answer your question the yeah. only the reason i hate the yield curve is that yeah uh i mean correlation versus causation drives me nuts the yield, wait, wait inversion the yield curve doesn't yeah. cause recessions and it only got this one right because of a fluke and it was well, because of I, the pandemic. I, I'm telling you, I, and you guys have to give me credit for this. I told you there was going to be a recession in 2020, almost two years before the recession hit. And the reason was the yield curve. The yield curve, yeah, I'm not saying it's a causation, but it definitely has a, something to say. And it's usually, and it is always very accurate. So you, you ignore the yield curve at your peril, Ryan, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're, you're, I'm you're, learning a lesson. Okay, there you go. All right, uh, Chris, what's your uh, what's your statistic of the week? Your data all right, point. All right, I'm going to give you two. Oh, okay. You're up for it. Uh, the am. first one, uh, fifty-eight thousand four hundred. Wait a second, fifty-eight thousand four hundred number of COVID infections on average over the past seven days. Uh, that's a good guess. It's pretty close to that, but uh, that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. You guys, you guys think I don't know stuff? I know stuff. <laughs> Okay, here's this one. one is uh, that is the uh, current value of Bitcoin. Uh, oh, that's, yeah. I knew that was coming. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The crypto king. I got uh, last week. Taken. It was last week. Just for context, fifty-eight thousand eight hundred seventy-seven. So, uh, uh -huh. those of you who listen to me, you know, you, you made a little, uh, <laughs> made a little money. You made some money. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, okay. What's your second the, statistic? Second statistic: twenty-seven point six billion. Oh. Huh. I don't know. I don't know what that one is. Yeah, that What's is that? Uh, consumer credit growth in the month of February. Oh, so really? Up substantially. It's a uh, eight percent, close to eight percent annualized. So uh, consumers are out there. They're borrowing. Uh, we saw big growth in revolving credit, which had been down. So uh, consumers are, are clearly coming back, and they're they're willing to borrow. I, I'm really confused by that one because we got all these stimulus checks, right? And the uh, surveys, Ryan mentioned the household pulse survey from census. I think it shows that 25% of respondents say they're paying down debt. Uh, so why would we see this increase in consumer credit in the context of the, that's just bizarre. I, how do you explain it? So I would say it's uh, distributional, right? You have to be careful what, uh, what groups you're talking about with the, with the checks versus uh, the borrowing and uh -huh. I think that I think two things can be uh, simultaneously true. Huh. That's and the one thing I would add is with revolving credit, it tracks gasoline prices. Right. So, you know, I mean, uh, when prices go up at the pump, you know, people are you know, swiping their credit cards. Oh, yeah. You maybe it's the, the difference between the transactions to your point, transactions versus debt, right? Because this reflects that number reflects both borrowing debt, people taking on debt, and also just an increase in the sheer volume of transactions, right? So if you're, you know, you're putting more stuff on your card, you're going to, it's going to show up as an increase. So, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yep. Here's mine. Uh, the back to normal index, the BNI, this is an index that 
we at Moody's have uh, constructed along with CNN Business, uh, and it measures the uh, where the economy is today compared to where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, in the last week, it was 86%. So that means the economy, based on all of this, the uh, economic data, third-party data that we have incorporated into the BNI, uh, says that the economy is operating at 86% of normal, 86% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so uh, good news is that's up from the bottom. You know, the low point was back a year ago in April. Hard to believe it was a year ago that we were in severe lockdown, but the index hit 60% of normal. So we've come way back, but obviously it does highlight the challenges here. We're still not, uh, we're still a long way from getting back to, you know, anything we would all feel comfortable with, about. Interestingly enough, this one other factoid, the state with the highest uh, back to normal measure is, anyone want to guess what it is? What do you think? No? It's where you are. Yeah, it, very good. I am. Florida. It's Florida. 97%. Uh, so we're Florida's only 3% away from being back to pre-pandemic levels. Okay. And uh, here's the, um, the bonus question. Uh, which state... Uh, and here I might, this is a, let's call it, say the, which big, relatively big state is got the lowest BNI, the lowest uh, back to normal index. California. Thinking. New York. Ah, oh, Chris is good. good. You know, Chris yeah. is really good. Yeah, he's absolutely right. It's uh, 74%. Illinois is not too far behind Chicago, obviously. So California is also pretty weak, but not quite as weak. So big urban areas you know, with big cities that got creamed by the pandemic early on are still, you know, lagging, uh, lagging here. But I will say, uh, Chris and I, you know, we've been, we have bets, uh, believe it or not, we have bets, dollar bets. And to Chris's credit, I have not won a dollar bet ever, uh, except I will win the next one around housing construction and housing starts. That, that's a winner for me. It's, uh, so gonna, two years, gonna, two years down the road. But, uh, two, yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to collect, baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. So how's All right. Your, uh, um, how's your, uh, speaking of Florida, though, how's your spring yeah. break going, Mark? My spring break? I, yeah. Are you kidding me? I'm sheltering in place, uh, you know, here on my back deck, you know, in, in Florida. So uh, trying to stay away from the crowds. But I'll tell you, uh, it's it, if you just walk into a, you know, we have Wawa's down here in Florida, too. You know, Wawa's are a staple in, um, in Philadelphia, our, our hometown. And if you walk into a Wawa, you, you, you wouldn't know that we were still in a pandemic. I mean, it's no one's wearing a mask. You know, people are just, it's crowded. So I try not to go in, um, but I'm still children. But I'm getting my second shot next week. So I'm oh, good. Feeling bad. Yeah. yeah. But so, there's your uh, back to normal index. Right? There's my back to normal just index. Just go to yeah. Wawa. And, uh... You know, that's right. You, I think that would work. That would. It's that all would of be, Mark's be, spending on coffee at Wawa. Yeah. 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 I'm still uh, sipping my coffee from this morning. I haven't quite finished. All so right. Mark, let's before move on we move on, topic. can I ask yeah. you one quick question? Sure. I read your weekly COVID piece. Okay. Oh boy. And in thir you said in 30 years of a professional forecaster, you've never been more confident in your forecast. You know, that's right. That's a that caught me statement. off guard. That's a strong statement, isn't it? It's that's bold. a very strong statement. In 30 years, I emailed I've Chris. Been... I emailed yeah. Chris. It was like, I think Mark's like Babe Ruth and calling his shot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. I've been doing this for 30 odd years. And of course, have made many projections some of which I feel confident about, some not so much, but I'll have to say I'm as confident as I've ever been in uh, this economy, we're, this rip-roaring economy we're going to have over the next, certainly over the next six months, probably 12, and you know, it's a little bit of a stretch, but maybe even 18 months, you know, going into mid-2022. We're, we're going to see a lot of GDP. We're going to see a lot of jobs. We're going to see much lower unemployment. I'm, I'm confident. Uh, you know, obviously, things can go wrong, but but I feel very good about things at this point. Um, but but uh, yeah, uh, th thanks for calling that out. Most uh, confident. Most, this, is, this is it. This is the pinnacle. Of the this, I've never been as confident, no. Wow. Never have. I really never have. Directionally, um, right? Yeah, well, in terms of the, the, the strength of the economy, right? I mean, you know, maybe it ends up being five or maybe it ends up being nine, you know, but, you know, that's in terms of spirit, in terms of, you know, what's going on, uh, in terms of the strength of the economy, uh, you know, our six, 7% growth forecast, I feel very, very strong, strongly about, I think we're, we're off and running here. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, okay, no more distractions. Let's move on. We're, we're running, you know, we're, this is a podcast. It's not a, you know, a lecture, but uh, so we have to get moving here. Let's talk about the big topic. And that is uh, the president, uh, President Biden's infrastructure plan. And just unless you haven't been paying any attention, the plan is a big one. Uh, if you tote it all up, it's uh, by my accounting over the next uh, 10 years, $2.6 trillion in increased spending on various forms of infrastructure and uh, some tax credits. There's some tax credits in there for uh, housing and uh, green and green uh, investment. Uh, there's also uh, to help pay for it, uh, uh, increases in corporate taxes. Over the next 10 years, the increase is about 1.8 trillion. So if you kind of do the arithmetic next 10 years, it does add to the budget deficit on a static basis. And I won't even go into what that means, but on, you know, uh, on a, uh, doing a straight up arithmetic, it adds about $800, $850 billion to the budget deficit over the next 10 years. Although, uh, if you extend out the horizon to 15 years, because the spending on infrastructure is one time and winds down and the tax cuts remain in place, after 15 years, the tax revenue generated from the higher corporate taxes fully pays for all of the government spending and the tax credits. And it's basically a wash on, on the, on the uh, budget deficit. But over the next 10 years under the kind of the Congressional Budget Office budget horizon of a decade, uh, you get $800, $850 uh, billion. Uh, so there's a lot of moving parts here. Uh, we did a study, our own, uh, you know, we quick uh, analysis, uh, came up with some uh, estimates. And, uh, you know, from, from I'll give you my three cents for quickly, and I'll turn it back to you guys to get yours. I think it's a winner. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to help the economy out, both near term, uh, you know, it's going to generate a lot of good paying jobs. Uh, but more importantly, much more importantly, uh, it's going to help the economy longer run that we've as a nation have been under investing in public infrastructure pretty significantly. And we can talk through some of the statistics, but we've been under investing and it's showing you can feel it in, you know, uh, everything we do. If you get on a train, get in, get in an airplane, in a car, you know, what's going on with the uh, power grid in Texas this winter, you know, the dilapidated water systems in Michigan. I mean, I, there's a gazillion examples of how this is really starting to weigh on all of us uh, in, our, uh, in, our, in our economy. And so investing in infrastructure longer run reaps benefit. And the, at the end of the day, 10 years from now, uh, the economy as measured by GDP is about 3% larger. So it adds three tenths of a percent to per annum growth over the next 10 years. And adds about 2.7 million jobs 10 years from now. Obviously, that's just a point in time, and it changes if you go out further in the future. But that gives you a sense of it. And the un most importantly, the underlying potential, so-called potential growth rate of the economy, uh, is uh, a growth rate of the economy is about a tenth of a percent per annum higher in 2030 as a result of the plan. Uh, so instead of growing, I'm just going to give you a sense of magnitude. Or instead of growing, say 1.9 percent per annum, that's what we previously had, it would now be 2% per annum. So, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot, you know, in any given year, it's not a lot, but over a period of a decade, a generation or two generation, that uh, that's a, adds up to real money and really makes a difference, will make a difference in people's lives. It makes a big difference in terms of asset returns and in terms of people's wealth, in terms of the fiscal situation. So in my view, and again, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of things we need to debate here and discuss, but, but from a 30,000 foot level, looking down at this plan, I, I, think, it's, I think it's a winner. I, I think we should do this thing uh, and uh, we'll be better off for it. But that's just my view. Um, let me uh, turn to you, Chris. Uh, what, what is your sense of the plan and, and where, do you think, uh, uh, where do you think the holes are? You know, what, what do you think the problem, where do you think the problems in the plan are? Yeah, so infrastructure, well, first of all, it's called an infrastructure plan, but that's a little bit of a misnomer, right? That there's a lot more than what we might consider at least traditional infrastructure in there. So uh, we'll come back to that. Let's put a pin in that and let's okay. come back to that because I want to talk about that, but let's put a pin, but keep okay. going. Yeah. So there are lots of different uh, components here uh, in terms of a traditional tr infrastructure. It's only, a, only it's a, about $600 billion by my uh, calculations in terms of highways, airports, ports, uh, what we would think of as traditional infrastructure. So first of all, there's a scale. So if we're just we're focusing on that infrastructure piece, I think there's no doubt that we need it. I think there's universal agreement um, in terms of the lack of investment, the neglect in a lot of the infrastructure that we have around the country. So that part, certainly on board with. I am a bit concerned, or my, my takeaway is we might be overstating the case in terms of what the predictivity 
enhancement would be from that investment. For me, this is more about uh, taking care of neglected infrastructure, right? Repairing what we already have. So it's more about uh, loss of avoiding loss of additional productivity versus really enhancing productivity, right? I don't think we're talking about building a new uh, highway system or you know putting in a lot of new bridges. This is this is about uh, repairing. Well, let's let's there. put a pin in that one too because I want to come back to that. Uh, okay. As well. well, that's my. Yeah. That, I okay. guess that's my my main point is that. Uh, okay. I think some of the gains you're talking about there. I think I think we will have gains, but I think it's overstated. I think uh, I don't think it's going to have quite the uh, the impact in terms of growth uh, that we're talking about. Okay. Well, so. you're you're a senator from uh, Pennsylvania. You're sitting there. Uh, the bill is now uh, up for a vote. Would you vote for it? As is. No yeah. changes. Well, uh, yeah, no changes. I, you can, we can discuss changes, but yeah, you had no choice. This is it. You got to vote yay or nay. And there's no option. There's no, there's no, uh, second bill coming around. Right. Uh, this is it, baby. You got to vote. Ugh. And don't think about your voters. I know you got, you, you're very politically oriented. You're worried about the voters, but you know, do lead, don't follow. Well, what, there's what we, the other aspect here, which we haven't touched on, which is how we are paying for this. I've got problems with that too. Uh, oh, bummer. Of, okay. You're not going right? to vote for it, are you? I'm on, I'm on the fence. I'm not convinced. You're like, you. you're like Senator Manchin. You're, you're, you're going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. We'll move on. I'm coming back to you. All right. By the way, I've already voted for it. Yeah. So uh, I'm with please. you. You with me, Ryan? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'd vote for it. You would, okay, all right. What, what, what? Do you, now, Chris is complaining about the what's infrastructure. He's complaining about the productivity gain. He's complaining about in a in a uh, in, a, in a Chris way the uh, corporate tax increases. So, anything in the program you don't like or you're worried about? Or you, I mean, if, if you if you were king, what what would you do to change it? You, you already think, said you're going to vote for it, but it doesn't right. mean you wouldn't change it. So what would you change in it? I'd have a more investment in uh, early childhood education. I mean, that's, I think that's Ooh. helps with longer term productivity growth. I mean, that's, but that's, that, a good that's the second package though. Don't you think that's the second? Well, you told me that there's no second package coming. So, oh, no way. If I had to tweak I didn't mean it. that. I mean, there's no second infrastructure package. Coming. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, not a lot of big changes that no. I would make. No. Okay. You like it. You would vote for it. Okay. I would. All right. Let me, let me, let me ask another question. So this is more of a personal question and, and not getting too personal, but if you had uh, uh, the ability to direct some of those infrastructure dollars, what would you, what project and try to be as specific as possible, what one thing would you spend money on? Because that would, you know, uh, help, um, well, I'll just end it there. You, you can pick whatever criteria you want, but what infrastructure project would you uh, put, put money on, put money towards? Chris yeah, or uh, Ryan? Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, yeah. Actually, it's a project that's not even on the list. It, I think yeah. we need to be investing in cyber infrastructure more than anything right now. Hmm. And that's not even discussed, not even debated. Um, I think that's where there's a huge vulnerability there's, there's discussion of expanding access, right? Rural, uh, rural internet access, that's great. But I think we have a, a huge problem in terms of threats. We're, you know, throughout the pandemic, we heard about yeah. the hacks. I think that's where yeah. we need to put more. I, I suspect that's out. coming. You know, that's probably not part of this package, but that doesn't mean it's not coming, you know, as part of the budget process or so. I, I think they're probably figuring they're going to get that money anyway, you know, as opposed to let's put it into this package. But, yeah, but that's, you, make, you make a good point. What about you, Ryan? What, what project would you uh, put money in? Might overlap a little bit with Chris, but like improving the electrical grid. I mean, we saw what happened in Texas you know, with climate change. It's only going to get worse rather than getting better. Also, we, I mean, tying it back with cybersecurity, I mean, you know, we're pretty vulnerable to a cyber attack to the electrical grid. And just imagine what that would do to the economy if you know, the electrical grid went down for a couple of days. Yeah. Okay. I, you know what I would do? And I know this is very self-serving, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I can't help myself, uh, Amtrak, uh, you know, uh, if, if we could only get from Philly to New York in a half hour, 45 minutes, and from Philly to DC in a half hour, 45 minutes, that would be, in my view, a big time game changer, you know, for the entire Northeast corridor uh, and 
certainly for me personally, it would make a big difference. So I, I in Philadelphia, it, it would, it would do wonders you, for the Philadelphia economy. Overnight. Would take off. It would mm-hmm. take off. It would take off. I, I you know, so. But there's uh, but 80 anyway, billion dreaming. for Amtrak, right? Uh, What's that? Isn't there 80 billion for Amtrak? Allocated? Yeah, no, there's Amtrak. I don't know where it's going though. Uh, but yeah, I don't know where it's going. Okay, let's oh, you go want back it focused to focused on uh, Philly to New York. I'm so. focused on that 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 corridor right there. You know, the, between New York and you know Philly, Wilmington, Baltimore, and uh, DC. I know I know that that corridor very well, and it certainly could use some help. It's um, Biden's favorite. But, so. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Actually, I've seen him on the train many times. Uh, Actually, I have a really good story. After he pulled out of the presidential race against Obama, did he, was it Obama? Yeah, he was in that race and he stopped, didn't he? Uh, I'm trying, I can't remember exactly which race, but I think he was early on in the race and he didn't go anywhere and he uh, dropped out. And I saw him in the, cause I live out towards Wilmington. So I get the train, when I go to DC, I take get the train from Wilmington. I saw him in the uh, little store they have in the Wilmington train station, looking at, uh, I think it was, it was like, it was like um, Hallmark cards or something. And I went up to him and I, he, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't remember any of this because he, a million people do this, but he was all by himself. He was literally all by himself. And I go up to him and I said, uh, you know, I uh, think very highly of you and I'm sorry it didn't turn out. And he was incredibly gracious uh, to me. So I uh, didn't know me from Adam, but uh, really stuck with me. You know, this guy was a real uh, uh, nice person, you know, in addition to, to everything else. So that really made an impression on me. Um, oh, let's go back though. Uh, Cause you, you bring up some good points, uh, you know, issues with the plan. What is infrastructure? Uh, and so you said, this isn't really, I think you said, this isn't really infrastructure. What did you mean by that? I don't think it's just infrastructure, right? Okay. It's, it's like, building. for example, and um, well, uh, R and D spending. Oh, really? I okay. like that part. I like yeah. that part. I don't get me yeah, wrong. I'm a big fan. I like R and D, but it's not traditional infrastructure, right? It's not what you would. Mm, I don't know. I think yeah, I, I would consider, you know, the basic, you know, uh, things like transportation, obvious infrastructure. Uh, and then you have things that go to, uh, I think R and D is building the, the, you know, the, the, the capital stock, you know, helping to build the capital stock. Uh, so I would view that as kind of infrastructure, long lived infrastructure. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there are, I would even consider workforce training and development, you know, uh, building out infrastructure as well. Um, but I thought you were going to mention the elder care cause there was a big, about 400 billion, I think it was 400, 500 billion of the 2.6 trillion in uh, support is elder care. That does, that does not feel like infrastructure. That feels like something that would go into the, the, the second package, the social, uh, uh, the social program package that's I think coming down the road. I yeah. thought you were going to talk about that. What about housing? Do you consider, because there's a lot in there about housing and housing supply, would you consider that infrastructure? No, I'm using very near. I'm. I guess I'm. Yeah. Uh, my definition is physical infrastructure. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I don't. I wouldn't consider that as part of the infrastructure. You would not. Okay. Again, I would. I would part company there. I mean, I think one of the uh, reasons uh, for weak productivity growth in recent years, maybe re- in the last couple decades, uh, has been the fact that we and you and I have worked on this a lot, Chris, is the affordable housing shortage, because you are because of that, forcing uh, people, lower income households to move further out into the suburbs and exurbs, further away from the jobs, longer commute times, more difficult uh, to get to work. And that uh, does affect uh, the productivity of, of the economy. And I, and I suspect that if we can increase the supply of that affordable housing in places that are closer to where the jobs are, uh, that will, and will ultimately help to support uh, long run productivity growth. In fact, that, I would use that as a definition here that anything that you know ultimately improves labor productivity, I would consider to be uh, infrastructure. Uh, you know, it goes to improving the the our ability to produce more with less. And I, I think uh, that that we need to have a more fulsome definition of what we mean by infrastructure. Elder care that's something different. That's labor force participation, perhaps, but that's not labor productivity. But the rest of it feels like it's about labor productivity. No, well, that's a pretty de- that's a pretty wide. Uh, 
that definition, yeah. right? So that's uh, yeah. so that's uh, college education, right? We should be uh, providing a college. Why isn't that in the bill here, right? Well, I mean, I, uh, I think that I think that should could be. I mean, you got to pick and choose, but that certainly could be, you know, part of it. Uh, that probably will be part of the, again the second package. But yeah, I think that would be a reasonable thing to throw into the mix. And also, college education is kind of a blend of labor productivity and labor force participation. So maybe you know, fits more on the participation side on the productivity side, but uh, you know, I'm splitting hairs. I, you know, so what do you think, Ryan? Are you, are you, do you have a view on this? Yeah, I think people are getting too hung up on what is traditional infrastructure versus what's in the package. I mean, they should have just named it the American investment plan and you kind of get rid of, you know, both sides of the argument. You're investing in infrastructure and then you're investing in human capital. And I think hopefully this bill gets through the way it is, or, you know, few tweaks here and there, but, you know, I'm concerned there's going to be moderate Democrats that, you know, say there's not enough or there's, you know, non-infrastructure things in here and they're going to vote against it, especially with the corporate tax increase. Okay. So let's move on to the second uh, concern you had, Chris, and that's around the productivity lift from the infrastructure spending. And your point, I think, I may have this wrong, is that all we're doing is uh, investing in depreciated public infrastructure, trying to get that back up to something that's more viable. It's not about breaking new ground. It's not like we're building a new highway system, you know, interstate highway system or some, some big, big deal, big program that would, you know, be a game changer. Uh, is that, is that your view? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So yeah. still productivity gains, right? Clearly, um, uh... A uh, road with a lot of potholes is going to be have less productivity than one that's nice and smooth. But it's not, uh, it's not, to your point, breaking new ground. It's not creating a new distribution route or, or enhancing uh, productivity uh, to the extent that a new project would. Yeah, got it. Hey, and Ryan, I you know uh, the, the Penn Wharton folks. Uh, they're they're a really good outfit. They do a lot of fiscal policy analysis. And they did an assessment of the Biden plan, just like we did. And, and, and just to remind everyone, we uh, found that after 10 years, uh, the economy is about 3% larger in terms of GDP, and that we have about 2.7 million more jobs. I don't mean to, to imply too high, too high degree of precision here, but that's, those were the numbers. Whereas I think uh, Penn Wharton came in with negative GDP. The GDP was actually smaller 10 years from now. And this may... Fit, this fits in with Chris's point about uh, productivity. Can I ask you to look into that? I haven't had a chance to really look at it. Can you give us a sense of you know where they're coming from and you know what their perspective is and why why they landed in a different why they landed with a negative sign as opposed to a positive sign? Yeah. So just to give you a couple numbers. So after ten years, relative to their baseline, uh, real GDP is zero point two five percent below the baseline. They go out to 2050 and it's still, you know, 0.33% below their baseline. Yeah. You know, I, I went through it and I think uh, they make a lot of really compelling cases. I think there's two areas that, you know, their assumptions differ or modeling techniques differ than ours. First is on the, the corporate tax side. Uh, you know, I think they're assuming a lot higher taxes, uh, ways on the economy more than I think what, you know, what uh -huh. you and Bernard were doing uh, in your, your uh, run of scenario. And then also it seems like crowding out is a much bigger factor in their uh, analysis than, you know, looking at our, our baseline forecast. Crowding out, meaning higher, the interest rates are higher because of the budget deficits. Are there, are there budget deficits mm -hmm. bigger than the static budget deficit that I mentioned earlier, the 800 billion over 10? Are they coming up? Yeah, I believe so. It's, it's larger. Really? And I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my arms around. Yeah. I got to go, you know, probably through it a couple more times, uh, yeah. you know, how they get their interest rate projections. It yeah. seems like a lot of it is tied to, uh, you know, the federal budget deficit. And at least, you know, a lot of the work that I've done, I mean, that doesn't usually have a big impact on long-term interest rates. Well, just to give you a sense of the, the, the numbers behind our assessment, and this goes to productivity growth, the productivity benefit. Uh, if you uh, add it all up across all of the different elements of the plan, uh, we... Uh, have a, a seven percent return. So what I, on on the on the infrastructure spending. So what I mean by that is if, I, if you take a dollar uh, of infrastructure spending at, in a portion it you know uh, like the Biden plan 
has allocated the money, you get seven uh, cents of return, the seven cents of return uh, uh, in, in terms of GDP, increased GDP. And that varies a lot by the type of infrastructure spending that's been proposed. So to give you a sense of that, on the elder care, that piece, I agree with you, Chris, that's, I don't consider that infrastructure spending. Uh, that, base, that adds nothing. There's no return on that in terms of labor productivity, in terms of productivity growth. Uh, you want to guess what the highest, the, the, the type of infrastructure spending had the highest return by our calculation? R&D. Is this traditional or what's in the package? The, the, across the board. R&D is actually very high, but not over, this is over a 10-year horizon. It actually has a very high return in the longer run. But over a 10-year horizon, it's broadband, investment in broadband. Oh, okay. It's a little over 10 cents. Uh, and then the uh, infra is kind of the traditional transportation. That's about seven, eight cents. It's about kind of an average. Housing was about six or seven percent kind of return. Uh, you know, it varies. Uh, you know, quite a bit. There was some spending on kind of federal government infrastructure. You know, buildings for the federal government that has a relatively low return. You know, in terms of labor productivity. But you add it all up, it's about uh, seven cents. And that's not too far from what CBO, Congressional Budget Office. Uh, has come up with in their estimates of infrastructure spending. It's a very similar kind of, of result. Uh, they're a little bit lower because they make the assumption that if the federal government is ramping up uh, uh, infrastructure spending, state and local governments will offset that by reducing theirs. And in, in my view, that's less of an issue in the current period because of all of the funds that state and local governments got under the American Rescue Plan they have a budget, many states are gonna have a budget surplus and a lot of that's actually gonna to go to infrastructure spending. So if anything, in the next couple, three years, we may see more infrastructure spending coming out of state and local governments, not less. But anyway, that's the difference between our estimate effectively and the CBO estimate. And if you do that kind of arithmetic, given the numbers here, you know, that's how you get to the kind of the productivity gains that I was talking about uh, longer run. So a uh, very different kind of perspective on things uh, uh, on, uh, on how that's gonna work. Finally, on the corporate taxes, this one really bugs me. Um, you know, <clears throat> where is the evidence that uh, the uh, lowering of corporate taxes that occurred in 2018, the Trump tax cuts, the uh, tax uh, job, uh, the TCGA, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, lifted economic growth? There, I don't see it. Do you guys see any evidence that There's that- none. There is none. I was so worried that you're going to argue that it boosted the economy and that you know we would just you know, go down a rabbit hole. But when you look at business investment by details in the in the national income and product accounts, when you strip out energy, there was no boost. Growth post tax cuts was almost uh, the same as pre tax cuts, if not a little bit weaker. So energy, and that wasn't tax related. That was higher oil prices at the time. So you know when you really dig into the details, there was no evidence that it boosted. Uh, business investment. Chris, I mean, uh, you're, you know, I know you're a wealthy guy and, you know, uh, all that crypto wealth that you have now, you're trying to protect that. You're a little worried about your tax rate. Do you have a different perspective on the benefit of the lowering of corporate taxes back in, in when uh, Trump cut them, President Trump cut them? Uh, I, I, I do agree there. I, I guess my, my point here is that's certainly not the only way to fund these projects, right? Is this the most efficient way to go forward, right? That, for example, there's nothing in here about a private private public partnership, right? Potentially, that could expand the amount of available capital and uh, help direct the uh, the investments towards the most profitable ones, right? That's always the issue when you have these types of large scale uh, plans: is how is the money being allocated? Yeah, you, know, you have these multipliers that you've you've quoted here, but uh, when the rubber hits the road, how do we? assess what are what are the guardrails or what are the what's the process to ensure that the taxpayers are getting the highest return on their investment right so we allocate these huge sums there's no there's nothing there to really uh, ensure that we are investing the, these monies properly so maybe a public part of private partnership would be effective or social bonds or you know there are lots of other ways to fund carbon uh, tax these, what's that Carbon, carbon tax, tax a gas tax, right? right? Gas tax. Is there any yeah. uh, increased gas well, tax? That is yeah, no, fair make. enough. Uh, yeah, fair enough. And, and just to connect the dots for the listener, I mean, I talked about the Trump tax cuts as not uh, supporting, providing much juice to the economy, certainly not longer run. And that's just to make the point that raising taxes or, you know, 
rolling back some of those tax cuts, which is what Biden is proposing to do to pay for this, probably will have very little long-term negative consequence. So the arguments that you know the higher marginal rate, that going from a 20%, 21% marginal rate on corporate tax ace, taxation to 25, or the president has proposed 28, previously it was 35 before the Trump tax cuts, would have a big negative impact. Really, I just don't see it. I can't see it in the data. It doesn't make intuitive sense. doesn't make theoretical sense. It's a pretty small, but I, I understand. Pardon me? Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Can I give you two numbers? Yeah, sure. So if you look at US corporate uh, uh, tax revenues that generate from a uh, corporate tax rate as a share of GDP, it's 1% in the US. It's 3% in the UK, 4% in Canada, 4% in Japan. W say that again. What's the one per what is the statistic? The is so what? So corporate tax revenue as a share of GDP. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we're, there you go. we're, you know, we're well below other, you know, developed economies. Yeah. And the second one is uh, Morning Consult did a survey this week and found that 65% of respondents were in favor of paying for the infrastructure bill through higher corporate tax rates. Yeah. Well, that, Chris, I think that's the reason, you know, it may not be, you, you know, if you were king, and I know, you, I know you are king, but, you know, <laughs> if you were the real king, you're, you know, uh, you, you, you might want to do it differently. I would do it differently too, but the political economy of this and, and also, I'd say, you know, uh, President Biden has, in it, for good or bad, made the promise that he's not going to tax anyone uh, below who makes less than 400K a year. So that does put you in a bit of a bind, you know, if you're going to stick to that campaign prom promise, so like a gasoline tax, you know, becomes, becomes you can't do it if you're going to stick to it because that, the incidence of that tax is going to be on lower income households. Carbon tax, I like that idea, but you know, if I were if I were king, I'd save that for climate change. Don't conflate it here with this. The corporate taxes are a very good way of paying for this because corporations are going to benefit enormously from this. They're the prime benefit, direct prime, prime beneficiaries of this. But the but carbon tax, I'm sympathetic to, but I I would hold on to that. Uh, anyway, we, we've we've got, got bigger. One of the key arguments of this plan is that it's uh, climate change focus. It's uh, you know we're building this infrastructure in a green way, right? So how is that the two are completed, right? So why yeah, wouldn't you I, connect I, the dots directly? Yeah, I want to get this done. I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I want to get this done. I want to get it through Congress. I want to get it signed. I know you're not voting for it, but I think I can get enough votes for it, you know, to get it through Congress. And if you conflate it with a, a, a carbon tax at this point, I don't know. You're just opening up a whole nother set of, worries, debates, arguments, regressivity, you know, it's regressive, right? Fundamentally regressive. You've got to solve that problem. There's all kinds of issues. I just, we need that direct hit on climate change. Let's save it. But, but I hear you. I mean, you know, you make, you make a, make a very good point uh, there. Um, anything else you guys want to bring up about the plan? There's obviously a lot to talk about. Actually, I will say you were harder on me than Maria Bartiromo. I want to, believe it or not, I went on Fox News Fox Business News, and she, uh, we, she and I had a bit of a debate, but I'll have to say she was nicer to me than you guys. I don't know what oh. you know. What, you got you know. She was very graceful about the way she she did that, uh, even though she's as wrong as as you are, you know, uh, Chris. Ryan, I no compromises, Mark. You're not going okay. to twenty five percent corporate. You're not uh, cutting anything. No, 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 no. Here. I compromise. I, I'll oh. compromise. I'll compromise. Okay. Yeah. Well, but we need another discussion for that. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, for, guys. Let me uh, just uh, kind of bring this home. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, this is a, a big deal, uh, this, this infrastructure package. And I, and I think it goes to something, uh, you know, even broader. And that is that we've got, as a nation, very large problems that have developed over periods of not just years, but decades and generations. I mean, we've got problems with our infrastructure, that is certainly a constraint on our ability to grow and to achieve the kinds of things that we need to. We've got big problems with climate change. We've got big problems with income and wealth inequality, racial equity. And uh, I don't think we can solve these problems uh, on our own. Uh, these aren't problems that the private sector can address uh, by itself. These are problems that can only be solved uh, collectively uh, through government. And I do think uh, one of the reasons why I am so optimistic about uh, the economy's future is that I think that uh, perspective is, has taken hold and we can execute on that politically. We're, I think it feels like we're going to get some things done. And yeah, we're going to debate you know, the, 
the individual aspects of the infrastructure plan and the social spending plan that's coming down the road. And yeah, we'll have some good debates about, you know, what, how do we pay for it and how much should be paid for. But at the end of the day, I think these things are going to get done and uh, we, you know, we're not going to solve these problems because these problems have been developing, you know, for, for generations. Uh, but it, it's a good start. Uh, we're, we're on our way and it makes me even more confident in our economic future. I think our next, well, I said at 6, 12, 18 months, I feel as confident as I ever have as, as a forecaster in the economy's prospects. And with things like this infrastructure plan, uh, if it gets passed, and I think it will, uh, our long-term prospects are, are brighter as well. So with that, I'm going to close the podcast. I do want to ask you, if you're a listener and you are enjoying this conversation, uh, please let us know. Rate the uh, podcast. That's uh, very important uh, to us and uh, to get your feedback. So I ask you to do that for us. And um, we'll be back next week. Uh, thank you.